Welcome, everyone. We've made it to Monday of week eight somehow. Through some, some kind of time sorcery. Uh, aside from being uh, Monday of week eight, this is perhaps the, the most important day in this class. Uh, anyone have a guess as to why? Oh. It's President's Day! <laughs> Happy President's Day! Uh, and we have uh, covered our, uh, I guess, 20 presidents so far, starting with Van Buren, uh, uh, William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, Polk, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson, Grant, Rutherford Hayes, Garfield, Chester Arthur, Grover, Harrison, Grover again, McKinley, and Roosevelt was last time, and so we have nine, nine presidents left before we conclude our, our presidential journey. Uh, any questions on uh, the lab or uh, the scheduling stuff before we get started? Uh, one uh, piece of administrative detail, you probably saw uh, the email about change in campus mask policy, so masks will be optional uh, in this class starting Wednesday. You're welcome to continue wearing a mask, we're not, as up to you. Um, all right, so uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is the lab five questions here? Uh, so look through the uh, design docs. They were uh, they were pretty good. Um, wanted to highlight a few things. Uh, there are two VP Map H files. Uh, there's one which has almost everything related to page tables, which is not architecture specific. Things like VP map copy, the VP map copy on write copy that you'll implement, these don't depend on the specific structure of the page table is defined by the architecture that you're running. There's exactly one thing defined in the architecture specific, which is uh, a struct that is the top level of x86 64 bit four level page table. You won't need to interact with that directly. Uh, you can, you'll just be doing, uh, interacting with it using the VP map uh, functions. Um, wanted to highlight that we are copying a page table when it comes to VP map copy. <laughs> VP map copy also copies all the pages that that page table references. Uh, and your, the new VP map copy you're implementing copies the page table, but not the pages. That's, that's the key distinction. Uh, if you want to copy the contents of a page, I would recommend mem copy. It loops through all the bytes of a page, copying them over one at a time. You could write that loop yourself, or you could use mem copy. Um, there are a couple functions uh, defined in uh, VP map. Uh, address space dump and address space mem info that will print stuff out about an address space uh, or memory region. Um, and those may be useful uh, as you debug. Uh, there are a number of questions about the page table write permissions. Uh, I've talked to, to some folks about this in, in office hours, but there are a number of macros such as PTW that define 12-bit masks to indicate the specific bit or bits that are responsible uh, for some quantity. So this PTW is what defines a mask for the write permission. And if we take these three hex digits and write them out in binary, we see that there is exactly one bit. The second bit controls whether a page table entry is writable or not. And we are changing the write permission that is the only bit that you want to change. You change other bits, you're changing other information about the page table entry, which may or may not have a consequential effect 
uh, when it comes to the test cases, but will be an incorrect implementation. So uh, make sure that you are only changing this bit uh, when you are making a page table entry read only. Uh, there is a VP map set permissions function, which uh, I would expect you would use in the page fault handler when you are setting the permissions of a page table entry to be the same permissions as the memory. So when we're doing copying and write, we're just changing page table entries to be read only. We're leaving their memory region alone because we want to be able to identify the situation where we have an entry that is marked read only, but is part of a region that has write permissions. That's what tells us that it's a copy on write. Uh, the page tables are just the struct VP maps. The address space has a pointer to this page table. The memory region has a pointer to the address space, which then has a pointer to the page table. Uh, that's how you will, you will interact with them. Question about this reference count. And reference count is used to determine when a page gets free. So we can look at the decrement reference count function and look down where if we subtract one from the reference count and the reference count is now zero, we will free that page. So that's how when we have a physical page that multiple processes are sharing, this reference count is how we keep how the system keeps track of when can this actually be deallocated. No one is using it. Uh, also, a question about what exactly are we are we copying when it comes to page tables? Uh, you're likely to have two pointers: one pointing to a source page table entry, the other pointing to a destination page table entry. And we want to have these pointers still point to separate memory, but what's in that memory to be identical to be copies. We don't want them to point to the same page table entry. Uh, that's likely to cause problems. You can't, for example, mark one. You can't change the permissions of one and not the other in that case. So the thing about how this would work in C, I wrote a little example code here. We have two integers and then two pointers that point to those integers. How would we use those two pointers to make uh, x have the same value as y? But we want to change the thing that p points to. So we'd have star p on the left hand side of that equals. And we want to change the value stored there to be the value that q points to. And so we'd have q dereferenced on the right hand side. And this would cause x to be a copy of, of y. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, last thing was. Uh, what is this PT adder macro? Uh, our page table entry has like a physical address, a physical page number, and then a bunch of other bits about write permission and everything else. So if we want the actual address, we need to mask out those lower order bits that are part of the address. Uh, that's what this PT adder macro does. It's in fact has the same effect as two other macros entry adder, and ppn. Uh, so all of those will have the same effect. Uh, it's useful for when you have a page table entry and you want to, and you need uh, an address, the address portion of it. So in the original VP map copy, it needed the address of the physical address of the original page because it was copying the contents of that page to some other page. Uh, so it, he references the pointer to get the actual contents of the page table entry, uses this macro to extract the physical page number, and then because memcopy needs virtual addresses, not physical, converts it to a kernel virtual address. Um, another instance where we might need this is if we want to do something with the reference count that requires a P at or T, a physical address. So if we have a page table entry. We might need to get the physical address from it in order to be able to say, increment the reference count of that page. Any questions on any of this stuff or, or other questions about lab five I didn't answer? All 
All right. Uh, one other piece of business is as you're thinking about the final project proposals uh, and writing up kind of thing what, what project you're going to do, um, there were kind of a one, one project that was not in the suggestions in the original document that I think would be interesting. Um, is there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of file system implementation already in place in OSV. After today we're going to spend three lectures talking about file system uh, design and implementation. Um, and so I, I think a final project could an interesting final project could be uh, producing some comprehensive documentation and, ana and analysis about the OSV file system. Uh, so, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, please come talk to me. Um, there, I have some more some more guidance on how that might work. Uh, but if you kind of uh, want something more focused on analyzing existing code, you probably be adding a lot of print statements uh, to figure out exactly how that file system is structured. Uh, this would be that kind of project. Um, I think something, uh, I don't remember the top of my head if scheduling priority was mentioned in the list of possible final project topics, but uh, we've been talking about that, uh, uh, we'll be talking about that some, some today, and so if there are kind of scheduling features that seem interesting uh, that aren't in OSV, that would also be a, a potential final project. Questions on that? All right, speaking of scheduling, let's do a bit of review. The last time at the end, we talked about a multi-level feedback queue. And I'd like you to think about how that approach approximates a shortest job first schedule. For C, I would agree that is the main way in which our Q is approximating shortest job first. Uh, why is that? Why is this kind of the important idea here? So, because if then the once they have their turn, if they haven't finished yet, they can go. Wait, did you say point at me? I did. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I didn't know this was on. Because uh, then after they finish their uh, thing, they'll go into the next queue. And so if they're fast, they'll get done as though they're fast. And if not, they'll eventually end up in the slow queue. Exactly. We'll run everything for some small amount of time when it first arrives. And if those jobs are short, we'll, we'll take care of them there. Any questions, Tom? All right. Why? is having some kind of scheduling priority, whether it's the multi-level feedback queue or some other uh, policy, uh, important to handle I.O. bound tasks efficiently. All right, I would agree with the majority here. Uh, our I.O. tasks require a little bit of CPU time to start maybe this long running operation. And so if we can't prioritize those, then we're missing out on this opportunity to have the I.O. like uh, to be reading the, the hard drive while the CPU is, is doing some other work. Does that make sense? Any questions on this? I guess I just interact with whatever the structure of clock is mean. Because it's like they all start for like they did this they get 10 nanoseconds. They all get like half of that. Say a new I.O. They still in the hot top priority queue. So when IO is done, they get that read really faster, whereas like in other structures they have to wait for that longer because they don't get this like high priority mm -hmm. where they're like the idea of what. Yeah, a, a multi-level feedback queue does this nicely because if our if our top top queue um, uh, uh, 
our top Q has um, like a 10 millisecond time slice. Our uh, kind of job A comes in, it needs to do like 2 milliseconds of CPU to start the I.O. It hasn't used up its 10 milliseconds yet, so it gets put back into this queue. Then the I.O. completes, it uses another 2 milliseconds to process that, and 2 milliseconds to start off another I.O. Still hasn't used 10, so it goes back in this queue. Um, yeah, so if we have a job that has needs lots of short CPU slices, it will kind of sit in the top level for a while, which uh, is what we usually want. Other questions? All right. So all the scheduling that we've talked up to this point has really been in this world where we just have one processor. We're just deciding for this one processor of the available uh, tasks, what are we going to run next? And so what if we had sequential tasks on a multiprocessor, meaning that we're, we're still thinking of the tasks as single threaded. We're going to, uh, we, we won't stay there, but we're starting there for now. Uh, but now instead of one CPU, we have multiple CPUs. So we have some set of tasks, some set of CPUs. Uh, how, uh, how can we approach this? So let's imagine we had one multi-level feedback queue that was shared across all our CPUs. So uh, we know that, that our multi-level feedback queue has a lot of nice properties, uh, but it's worth thinking about with this approach where we have one shared by all CPUs, uh, could that have any potential downsides? So I'd like you to take four or five minutes, brainstorm with your neighbors, <coughs> potential problems that we might encounter when we move from our MFQ for one processor to now using it uh, shared across multiple processors. Uh, I just mean the tasks are single. Uh, but like each process is one thread. Uh, we're not worrying about a process like a multiple thread. I'm going to be playing the same model that you missed. Like you more worry about it. Encounter here. You want to have a, a suggestion of something we might need to think about? Carl? Um, 
things that need to happen sequentially will try to happen in parallel? Uh, um, yes. Yeah, so, so by sequential task, I mean just each one is single threaded. Oh, okay. So, like the operations in a single thread would still happen sequentially. We just have like a bunch of these tasks that are all single threaded. I was interpreting that as multiple tasks that needed to happen in a particular order. Yes. That if if that's what this was uh, referring to, then yes, we would we that we now have some like it, it, we like wouldn't even want a multiprocessor in that case because we need these to happen in a particular order. Um, but these can can happen in any order. Uh, each task is sort of self-contained. Okay. If you have multiple processors trying to like pop or push stuff to a few, like you might need a lock of some sort so we don't lose stuff. Yeah, exactly. We have this data structure, these queues, and now we have multiple things adding and moving. Uh, and these queues will sometimes like remove from one and add to another. Um, so maybe we have kind of one lock for the whole thing, or even if we have some more fine grained locking. We might need to worry about now all these processes are sort of bottlenecks trying to acquire the lock on our on our queues. Um, and that's going to, to interfere with the benefits we might get from being able to run them in parallel if instead of doing useful work, they're all just waiting for, spending a lot of time waiting for locks. Yeah, so have to worry about that. Uh, other, other potential problems? Question. One thing that I thought of was that if you had like a separate Structure like structure for each CPU, you could maybe have one CPU that has like is given like higher priority tasks so it doesn't get like bogged down by like all the other stuff running. Yes, so that is an excellent idea. Uh, and we'll, we'll just skip ahead of our problems here to say that. that there is a technique called affinity scheduling, which says each processor is going to have its own multi-level feedback queue. And that uh, will, threads that are, have been run on a particular processor will be kind of rescheduled on that same processor. So affinity here referring to that, like, that a given thread will have some affinity for a particular CPU that it will kind of want to be run on that CPU. So aside from kind of splitting up this data structure into one per processor, which would give us less lock contention, uh, what is a technique that we have used in the past uh, that made, uh, that increased, uh, that, that increased performance um, that uh, if a thread was not assigned to a specific CPU and was instead kind of jumping around between CPUs, that might disrupt this, this strategy. Regression caching. Exactly. And we have some of the caches, like the TLB, uh, our L1 caches, these are per CPU. And so if we're constantly moving a thread between CPUs, it can't take advantage of anything that was cached in the CPU or it was running before. And so by having a thread kind of stick with one CPU, we can potentially gets much better cache performance. The other thing is that with one 
only a little feedback queue across all processors. That data structure itself is likely going to be pinging back and forth between caches on different CPUs as they're all like accessing it, updating it, does updates need to be sent to other processors, etc. Uh, so really going to be helpful to, to split this up per processor. Does that make sense? What are your questions on this? Does it mean like when the kernel starts task, it like pick, basically picks a processor to like plug it into? And then like how does it like move? Does it like every so often it just like decides to like move this process, this task to another one? Or is it like Right. So this could be implemented in, in different ways. Uh, we might think that yes, when a thread is created, it's we kind of give it an affinity. We like should try and run on this processor. Maybe whichever processor has the least things in its queue. We put a new thread there. And then uh, when a thread blocks or something, we record which processor it was running on, so then we stick it back in the same queue when it's ready. Um, And it would probably also be useful if idle, if idle CPUs can kind of take threads away from busy CPUs so that we try and um, kind of maintain an even balance of, of work. Did that answer your question? Other questions? All right, so let's leave the simple world of sequential tasks. And talk about how can we approach scheduling when we have uh, parallel programs, meaning we might have a single process that can have two, four, uh, 16 different threads that are part of that, that single process. Uh, and uh, how can we how can we approach that? So Let's say we have uh, a process with, with multiple threads, and those threads are running on different CPUs, and one of those CPUs switches out one of the threads from that, that program. Uh, is this going to be OK? Uh, should we be able to do this? Rather, when we switch this out, could that cause the program behavior to be incorrect, or is it safe to do? Okay. Uh, we would need to update the value of the registers, other dependencies, right? Yeah. So, so we would need to kind of save the state of one thread and update them to the to the new threads. Um, so, like from the perspective of this one thread, uh, like we can resume it running where it was. But from the perspective of this whole process that has these multiple threads, uh, maybe, maybe co co cooperating in in some way, uh, could this cause problems with those? This is specifically why we need things like locks and condition variables, because we might have multiple threads where one gets switched out and others get to run, and they may be kind of, this may happen in an unpredictable way. And so as long as we're kind of protecting shared data, such as if this thread that just got switched was in the middle of updating some data structure, that it's still holding a lock, and so other threads won't come in and, and kind of mess with that operation until this thread gets to kind of finish its critical section. So from a correctness perspective, this is fine. Um, but 
But from a performance perspective, uh, this might not be fine. Um, that in the case of what's called oblivious scheduling, meaning that That our scheduler doesn't know anything about how kind of multiple threads within the same application, like, doesn't know anything about whether they need to be run together or uh, what the relationships between them are. It's just oblivious and that there's a big pile of threads and it's going to kind of schedule them however, without knowing anything about what those individual threads are doing. And so there are some, some issues that arise from having this oblivious scheduling. So we might think we have these algorithms like multi-level feedback queue um, that maybe could handle this situation fine. They're kind of giving every thread a kind of uh, fair chance to run for some definition of fairness. And so what's the problem? Uh, one common technique for implementing a parallel program. Um, well, I guess let me ask you: What uh, if our program has a bunch of work to do and wants to do that work faster by using multiple threads? What's something that what's what's a strategy the program could use to improve its performance with multiple threads? Oh, so like divide the task into like, smaller tasks and then let one CPU to work on the smaller task for as long as possible. Yeah, it's If we split up the work that we have to do in just kind of smaller chunks, then we might be able to do this faster with multiple threads. Uh, for example, if I uh, want to write a, a, a program that's going to uh, uh, crawl the internet, down downloading every uh, photograph of a president that has ever been uploaded, uh, that's a lot of photographs. So I may want to split this up into multiple threads, where kind of each thread is separately. One thread is crawling Wikipedia, one is doing Google image search, one is uh, uh, doing a, a Bing, or, or what have you. But split this up into multiple chunks. Um, and it's going to be some sort of situation where We have some number of CPUs, and kind of they all do some kind of uh, some computation locally. They're all kind of uh, uh, crawling the web, downloading these these images, uh, and then there is. Some sort of point where they all need to, to synchronize and kind of communicate with each other to say, oh, kind of these, uh, uh, this thread needs to tell the others kind of what it's already done so that they don't repeat its work, something like that. Uh, and then uh, they continue uh, after that point with their own local computation. Uh, so under oblivious scheduling, uh, anyone see how that could undermine our uh, performance in uh, in this sort of, with this sort of parallel program? Uh, 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> have to stop every uh, CPU so that they can talk to each other um, and completely halt the process. Yeah, we do have to kind of, so we do have to, to have some waiting. Uh, and so is there a way the scheduler could cause some to wait longer than they otherwise would need to? And if our, if our CPU 3 runs this task for a little bit, and then switches to running something else, then this task might take considerably longer than either of the others, meaning that the scheduler, by kind of just making one of our tasks take longer, causes these others to just have to wait and do nothing. And so our, our oblivious scheduler, because it doesn't know that these are related, like this switch was actually very costly. As it caused these other CPUs to just have to wait for, uh, for this one to catch up. Does that make sense? We've also seen models where of kind of producer-consumer computation, where kind of one thread, one thread feeds it out, its output to another thread, and that thread passes its output to yet another thread, and so on and so forth. Could our oblivious scheduling cause a problem with this model of parallelism? Yeah, why is that? If it was like three first, then two, then one, it's going to like, that means have to wait too long because nothing's going to get finished. Yeah, if, if our scheduler kind of doesn't, like, uh, context switches one of these middle tasks uh, at some point, um, everything has to wait on whatever the slowest one is. And so, if the scheduler was kind of aware of the ordering of these, let's say, then it might be able to, to avoid those kind of mishaps. So, we have oblivious scheduling. Uh, anyone have a suggestion for what, what our scheduler might try and do to not kind of leave these parallel programs with these, uh, with these bottlenecks? So these sorts of problems arose because our scheduler kind of switched out one part of our, like one thread within our application um, uh, at, a, at an inopportune time. Okay. You could try and schedule it so that all of the tasks run, all of the tasks, all of the threads for a process run at the same time. Yes, exactly. We could do what's called Gang scheduling, which is we're going to uh, designate a set of threads designate a set of threads that must run together. And so a straightforward application of this, just all the threads for a particular application. Those all have to run together or not at all. And so in this case, we avoid this situation where kind of one part of our application is creating this big, this big bottleneck. This works very well if we have kind of one application that we want to kind of give priority to, that we have a single purpose web server or we have a database that needs precise control over a thread assignment. And by letting this application threads all run together, uh, we might be able to get a lot better performance for that one application. Uh, 
but there are a couple things that could kind of undermine us here. It's possible that, uh, well, if we have a, a bunch of applications, all of which we're trying to gang schedule, all of which we're trying to run all the threads at the same time, uh, now our our uh, now our schedule is not going to be able to like give this kind of priority to a single a single process because if we have four CPUs um, and kind of a, a bunch of and a bunch of applications that all have three or four threads, uh, we're now kind of trying to if we can't kind of take over the whole set of CPUs for a particular application then we kind of can't run it. Um, and so this, this kind of lacks maybe some, some flexibility when we have multiple parallel applications. Uh, would we want to, uh, would we want to kind of apply this policy to every application running on our system? To say like, no matter what an application threads, all must run together or, or not. Why not? Could it be possible for an application to create more threads than you have CPUs? We could have a, an application with with a whole bunch of whole bunch of threads. Um, let's let's assume we limit applications to like you can't create more threads than there are CPUs. So, I mean, you don't need to. There are plenty of things that aren't going to have bottlenecks um, and don't have to run sequentially like that. And so there's no reason to you're just forcing the uh, they're forcing the schedule to make their blocks, which you don't need. Yeah, not every program actually is going to benefit performance-wise from getting additional CPUs, even if it has multiple threads. Um, and so we're kind of applying this with too broad a brush. We end up kind of giving a bunch of CPUs to processes that don't actually benefit from it. And In practice, it can often be better to give each process, um, uh, if we have kind of two parallel programs to run each of them with half the processors, rather than running one of them with all the processors. And we focused on the idea of how can we take the time that a CPU is running and kind of share it among different processes. Uh, but we can take the other perspective and think of, we have some set of CPUs, how do we share those among different processes? So this idea of, of space sharing is kind of sharing of CPUs as the unit rather than kind of slices of time uh, on a single CPU. And so we'll assign a specific, uh, we'll assign CPUs to specific programs. So we have CPU one, two, and three. Maybe we say, okay, CPU one and two, you are for running process A. CPU three, you're for process B, uh, and so we're kind of not trying to take all the CPUs and give them kind of all to the threads of process A and then all to the threads of process B. We're kind of uh, dividing our resources um, uh, using this this different approach. Does this make sense? Questions on this? So let's say process A is given these, these two CPUs. Uh, and process B is given CPU 3. Uh, and then process B finishes. Uh, and we don't have anything else. Uh, and we say, OK, process A, you now get this CPU 3 as well. Uh, 
do we, like, would it be helpful? Um, I guess, like, do, do we need to tell process A when this happens? Like, would it be would it be useful for process A to, to like somehow know that it now has CPU three? Doesn't it? Because otherwise, it, means it doesn't know to start scheduling stuff for the process there, right? Unless it knows it exists. I mean, it's not going to do anything if it doesn't know it's there. Yeah, Sebastian. Well, I was thinking that like it doesn't need to know, but it might be useful because then like you could when the you like the user writes the program, they could like account write something to account for how many CPUs it has. But like I don't think they would necessarily need to know. Yeah, this and, and, and this gets back to, to to Victor's question. Well, what if a process creates more threads than it has CPUs? So in some sense, we want like. I agree that, that process A will like still be correct, even if it has no idea uh, how many CPUs, but it might want to, if it gets a CPU taken away or gets another CPU, we might want, it, it, it might be able to respond in a useful way to maybe create more threads or kill them some threads or uh, start some like non-time sensitive but useful background process if it has another CPU to take advantage of. Um, but it's our scheduler in the kernel that is making this decision, and, or, and that is like allocating these CPUs. It's not the user process, and so uh, we'll want something called a scheduler activation. That like when the scheduler makes this decision. It's going to send a signal to the user process. Like the kernel is going to send a signal to the user process saying, hey, I've given you another processor, or hey, I've taken a processor away. Um, and this kind of sending a signal from the kernel to the user process the kind of more general, like non scheduling specific idea is called an up call. Like we have system calls that go from the user down into the kernel, and if we have something that goes from the kernel up to the user that like the kernel generates, it's uh, often referred to as an up call. Um, and so the user process, just like uh, like when the when the user sends a system call uh, to the kernel, uh, how like when you implement a system call, it's like what is that setting up? Um, like when the like the the uh, like when the user makes a system call, they might execute some instruction like int eighty. Uh, what is this? Like what is what what events follow from from this? Um, like a system call handler for that int eighty. Yeah, it, it invokes a specific handler that the kernel has set up to respond to a specific event. Exactly same idea for our schedule activations. The user process will have some handler, some function that gets executed when one of these signals arrives. Uh, on Unix-based systems, these are referred to as signals. Uh, on Windows, I think they're called asynchronous events. Um, same idea either way. Any questions on uh, this kind of uh, scheduling for better performance piece? All right. Let us talk about William Howard Taft. Uh, interesting, interesting career. Um, he uh, was um, uh, became, kind of was interested in a career in the law. Uh, was appointed to a kind of federal judgeship, um, and then uh, William McKinley calls him up, brings him to Washington. Taft is 
uh, uh, really hoping that he's going to get appointed to the Supreme Court. Um, but McKinley says, no, what I actually want you to do is to go be the governor of the Philippines. You may remember that the U.S. had annexed the Philippines from Spain. Um, and Taft isn't super excited by this, but McKinley says, well, once your work in the Philippines is done, then I will appoint you to the Supreme Court. So off Taft goes. Uh, there was actually uh, the uh, people in the, in the Philippines had started a war for independence from Spain. Uh, and this, just, this transitioned into a war of independence from the United States. Uh, when the United States became the, the colonial power there, um, and so Taft was there trying to kind of set up a, a non-military, like a civilian government rather than just the U.S. Army. Um, and he makes some progress there, and so uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, asked him to come be Secretary of War in his administration. Uh, Taft, again, just really wants to be on the Supreme Court, he wants to be a judge. And again, Roosevelt says, you know, you, I'll appoint you to the Supreme Court eventually. Come, come be Secretary of War. So Taft does that, um, and then Roosevelt, when he, and so we have this uh, cartoon where, where Roosevelt is uh, kind of bringing Taft into to the kind of uh, upper echelons of uh, politics. And so then Roosevelt had made this pledge not to run for another term, uh, and so he basically bullies the Republican Party into nominating Taft, his kind of chosen successor. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, you can see Roosevelt kind of, hand, he thinks Taft's going to be the best person to pursue all of Roosevelt's policies. Uh, so Taft really this, this kind of, uh, kind of not, not an independent um, thinker in the presidency, so I want to just kind of continue what Roosevelt does. Um, but that was not getting, giving Taft enough credit. Um, kind of pursued some of his own policies. Uh, notably, he, like Roosevelt, gets a lot of the attention for uh, crusading against monopolies and antitrust. Taft, in practice, did uh, you know, more of that than Roosevelt was able to. Um, and Roosevelt, uh, I think for largely reasons of, of ego, but also policy, kind of decides that uh, uh, he's unhappy with Taft, and so he's going to come back and try and run for, for president in, in 1912. Uh, he doesn't get the nomination for the Republicans, and he says that he's feeling as strong as a bull moose uh, when he loses that convention, and so he runs as the Progressive Party candidate, and it's called the Bull Moose Party, for here's this kind uh, of his famous smile and piercing his glasses on a moose. Um, and what this does in practice is splits the uh, uh, more than 50% uh, between Roosevelt and Taft, just splits it basically evenly between them, and Wood Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, uh, becomes president with 42% of the vote. Um, uh, also interesting that in this campaign, Roosevelt espouses a number of, uh, at the time, very kind of radical progressive ideas that would uh, be incorporated by his uh, second cousin, nephew, anyway, by Franklin Roosevelt, who would become president a couple decades later. All right, that's our presidential facts for today. Uh, with our uh, remaining time, I want to talk about a um, concern we might have besides performance. So, uh, Let's consider something like uh, a phone or a laptop, um, something with, with a, a battery in it. Uh, would we want our kernel to always go for maximum performance? What's something that we might need to be concerned with in, in this kind of environment? Jim? So the CPU is very battery intensive. So you might want to like have a different strategy when, when you are off like the charger. Yeah, yeah, very battery intensive. So we might want some kind of energy aware scheduling. 
some kind of scheduler that will actually take into account uh, how much energy a particular uh, policy might might require. You may remember from uh, when we were talking about caches, uh, I also talked about the Apple M1 uh, chip, uh, and it had two kinds of CPUs. Does anyone remember what those two kinds were? Oh, no, but it's causing a problem in our prompts. I, can't, <laughs> I know that it's, it's been difficult. So uh, I know two have like high energy use but more computing power, and two are more energy efficient but less computing power. Yeah, exactly. We have kind of both fast CPUs uh, fast high power, and we also have slower low power CPUs. And so our given this hardware, our scheduler can now take into account like which CPUs which and which kind of combination of CPUs uh, should it use for any given task. Um, aside from CPUs, anyone have thoughts on, on what uh, in this phone, what other kind of energy intensive uh, things we might need to be aware of. Uh, the screen, the screen is insane. Yeah, for the the screen definitely would would consume energy. Victor? On a GPS, I think that's one of the reasons that Pokemon Go would take so much energy. Yeah, uh, GPS kind of uh, we're sending signals on an antenna. Uh, in the phone, that definitely takes energy too. Um, I'm wondering about memory. Like you, 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 need, you need to like give electricity to frequently refresh it, right? Yeah, our 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 memory needs energy. Um, I think in practice, that's not going to be a particularly large slice of our energy pie, and it's also not clear how, that we can afford to turn that off. Um, so we're not going to be able to to at least not with current technology kind of. Conserve energy with with memory. Sebastian. I don't know if phones have dedicated graphics processors, but graphics processing units take up a lot of energy. Yeah, abs absolutely. So there are, um, I mean, we have uh, any idle CPUs, uh, GPS, screen. Um, we have a GPU, uh, and definitely kind of Wi-Fi or data, like anything where our phone has to like actively like power up an antenna and try and send a signal across perhaps a long distance. Like that's going to be a pretty high power operation, um, and so we might want to kind of turn them off when we don't need them or. If it's not a phone, but maybe some like little embedded weather monitoring device, it probably turns on its Wi-Fi like once a day to like send a signal and then immediately power off. Um, one way to think about um, our low power. Uh, our, our energy aware scheduling is a kind of plot on two axes here. So on the x here, I have response time, and how quickly would this operation complete? And on the y-axis, I have kind of user-perceived value. So you might think about uh, if we have very low response time, like 
0 to 100 milliseconds, something like that. Uh, the, the, the user perceived value uh, between 1 millisecond and 10 milliseconds, in most cases, that's going to be negligent. So there may be slight penalty as we increase response, response time at this, at this low end. Uh, but then as we go from like 100 milliseconds to 10 seconds, like big drop in kind of our satisfaction with this operation. Um, 100 milliseconds versus 10 seconds, that's just in a totally different category. Um, and then once we're at this kind of slow end, uh, like particularly like uh, one hour versus two hours, like yeah, that's definitely a difference, but if it's just something I say run overnight, like I don't really care whether it's one hour or five hours. So this again, kind of, we get gradual decrease here. And we can think about um, here, like in this region, like the delay is probably not noticeable to the human. So this, this would be a good region in which to, if we can conserve power by going from here to here in response time, like that's probably a good idea. Uh, same thing down here. We're down in this region, delay matters a lot less, so again, like we can afford to give up some performance if it saves us power. And we might want to you know, optimize performance when we're in this region, where kind of increasing, decreasing our response time, even a small amount, might kind of give us a, a lot of bang for our buck in terms of um, the, the value of whatever uh, whatever we're computing. Uh, questions on this? Does this kind of schema make sense? So one one other thing that I might call out um, is uh, what if we have um, like let's consider some specific applications like we have something like high frequency stock trading. This means we have a computer that's trading stocks very rapidly to try and make money. Or we have something like a self-driving car. Uh, take a couple minutes and discuss with your neighbors, like, where would, kind of, how would we, like, would these applications have this same curve, or would it look different in terms of value versus response time? Uh, so take a couple minutes and discuss that with your neighbors. All right. Thoughts on our response time versus value for our applications here. Maybe someone I haven't heard from yet today. <laughs> well, um, probably in, in in the case where they're active, what you don't want to really conserve power. Although, of course, like for special cases in, for HFT, you might conserve power in the hours where the market's not active. Uh, so, if we kind of were to put a curve on here of like what the value versus the response time is. Um, you have a, a, a thought on kind of what that what that might look like or how it might be different from our kind of nice smooth curve here. Yeah it would be like a clip it would like either matter like entirely or not at all. Exactly. These are what we might think of as real time 
applications, which one way to think about it is this is something where we have a deadline. Like right? easiest to see with a self-driving car. Like the car does not decide whether it needs to turn or not in a certain amount of time. Then we have catastrophe. Like what if, if it makes that decision like five seconds later, it that doesn't help us. <laughs> so like high value until some point in which it's too slow, and then we get absolutely no value. Like we're not trading stocks like fast enough to to uh, take advantage of temporary price fluctuations. Like we get in the data, and the time it takes us to execute a trade, the price has already changed, uh, or like those tra that trade isn't available. This also like just can't work. Uh, so when we're dealing with like real time applications, we kind of don't have this same behavior. Is like either it's fast enough or it's useless. All right, that will do it for today. Uh, the new quiz is posted on Moodle. That's due Wednesday, 9 p.m. Uh, keep working on lab five and final project proposal. I will see you in office hours this afternoon, not or on Wednesday. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody.